So thank you all again for coming. My name is Abby Fennewald. I run all the in-store events here at Politics and Pros. Um, we're so happy to have you with us here tonight. Um, and we have with us uh, Dana Thomas to discuss her new book, Gods and Kings, The Rise and Fall of Alexander McQueen and John Galliano. Um, the book talks a lot about the business side of the fashion industry and these two fascinating um, personalities uh, that had such a big effect on it. Um, and she talks a lot about how um, you know their creative personalities were Affected by the business of the industry, in some ways a follow-up to her first book, Deluxe, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, so she began her career actually here in D.C. with the Washington Post, and now is a contributing editor for T, the New York Times style magazine. She's written for a variety of publications, including Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and The New Yorker, and um, we're very happy to have her here with us tonight. So please join me in welcoming her to Politics and Prose. Thank you. It's so nice to be home. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Here's my book. Um, five years ago this week, on a cold winter's night, I was sitting w at my nine-year-old daughter's ballet school in Paris, waiting to take her home, when a news alert from Women's Wear Daily blipped up on my telephone. The first one read, Alexander McQueen has died at the age of 40. The second one was more ominous. Alexander McQueen has been found dead in his apartment. The third update was shattering. Alexander McQueen had taken his own life. I sat there with the tiny ballerinas flitting about in pink, pale pink leotards, stunned and unable to speak, as if someone had kicked me in the stomach. How could this have happened? Why did this happen? He seemed, at least from outward appearances and by the fantastic work that he'd been recently doing, to be in such fine form, really at the top of his game, peerless in the fashion business. In the days that follow, friends and family came forth stating that he'd killed himself because he was profoundly despondent over the death earlier in the week of his mother from cancer. But that didn't sound right, and it didn't feel right. I thought at the time there must be more to this story. Almost exactly a year later, I was driving along a French highway on a Saturday morning heading to the country when my cell phone rang. It was my friend Jenny Barchfield, an ace reporter for the Associated Press in Paris. Did you hear about John Galliano, she said. No. What happened, I said. I braced myself for a more McQueen-like news. He got in a bar fight in a cafe in the Maui, she said. Apparently shouted some anti-Semitic insults and was arrested. I'm not surprised, I said. Why, she asked. I told her about Galliano's fondness for partying, as he and his colleagues described it over the years and the tales I'd heard of late from fashion industry sources of the apparent exasperation by his colleagues and bosses at Dior and his namesake brand, of his erratic behavior and his missed work days. His clothes weren't selling as well as they once had, and there was, a gen there was this general, if unspoken, consensus in fashion that Galliano's days at Dior were numbered and that he was sort of sliding downward in his career. Do you think he'll be able to weather through this and keep his job? Jenny asked me. No, I said. Three days later, The Sun, the British tabloid The Sun, published its now infamous video of Galliano during another drunken episode at the same cafe, also hurling anti-Semitic insults. By the end of the week, he'd been fired. As I wrote a story about his downfall for the Washington Post, I found myself penning a paragraph about several other designers who had cracked up in recent years, most notably McQueen. And I thought to myself, there's something going on here. This isn't right. So I called my book editor in London and talked it through with her. I said, you know, what would this take to turn this story into a book? So we talked for about half an hour. And then it started to become clear to me Galliano and McQueen, from what I could see, were victims of the war between art and commerce in fashion in the age of globalization. 
the same war that has raged in all the creative businesses in the last two decades. During those years, luxury fashion, like so many other industries, had undergone a massive change, evolving from small, private, privately held companies that did 50 or $100 million a year of business to publicly traded global conglomerates that, did, that do 5, 6, 10 million, billion, sorry, 10, 5 or 6 to up to $10 billion a year in sales. Back in the late 1970s, Louis Vuitton had two stores, Paris and Nice, and they'd had these two stores for 100 years. And they did about $14 million a year in sales of those monogram bags. That was all that they sold. Today, there are more than 400 stores. I'm not even sure how much they do in business anymore. It's hard to keep up. I think between five and six billion dollars a year in sales. And the luxury industry does more than 300 billion dollars a year in sales. John Galliano got his start back in 1984. The former fashion designer Refat Ozbeck told me back then, fashion, quote, fashion wasn't a big industry as it is now. We wanted to make beautiful things and have fun along the way. There wasn't the pressure to do handbags and shoes and perfumes. It was about the clothes, the shape and the feel and the colors. Galliano found a backer and produced two collections of women's wear every year, two. He spent six months thinking about them, working on them. And what conceptual creative, creative collections they were. His first, out of school, was titled, already it had a title. It wasn't just spring, summer, 1985. It was titled, Afghanistan Repudiates Western Ideals. It was about commentary on the Afghan king Amullah Khan, who, after visiting London in the 1920s, encouraged his subjects back home to dress Western style as part of his social modernization movement for the country. They didn't like it. And there was a backlash to his reforms, and he was eventually overthrown. Galliano took this idea of this East meets West, of the Savile Row tailored suits, pinstripes, hats, waistcoats, and mixed it with draped robes in muslin and, and muted colors. He dyed the fabrics himself, blood red and turmeric yellow. And with the help of two assistants who worked for free, he made the collection. Those fabrics he dyed in tubs, you know, in buckets in his bathroom at the studio. He had to dye in his fingers. So deeply involved with Galliano was his creation that when he went to the presentation at this big hall in um, London, Olympia, it was like a convention center. And he'd had, he didn't do a show, he just had to stand and did a little presentation on a model for retailers to see the clothes. And retailers still recall that he appeared not to have slept or bathed in days. His fingernails were grimy from dye. And as one told me, he smelled. It was horrible. You could smell it throughout Olympia. This is 30 years later this person recalled this. For me, that showed how completely involved he was in his creation, that he hadn't even realized that he was so filthy. And this is someone who's extremely fastidious otherwise. For his second collection, six months later, he decided to stage his first show. This collection would also have a title, The Ludic Game, a reference to the ludi, or public games of ancient Rome. The show's story was based on Angela Carter's 1984 book, Knights at the Circus, about a 19th century ringed, winged aerialist named Fevers. Let's stop about, think about that for a moment. A collection of clothes that you and I would wear based on a 19th century winged aerialist. From there, Galliano added Celtic, pre-Raphaelite, and Victoria, Victorian references. As his press handout described it and read, a Bruegel painting cavorts around the maypole of a village green in Dorset. 
this was how he saw his collection. For the silhouette, he continued down the same path he began in St. Martin's, the, the art school where he attended as, as a student, making deconstructed clothes that could be worn upside down or interchangeably as skirts or jackets. As he put it, imagine a room full of kids and a box of clothes. Put a shoe on your head. It's a wonderful, naive approach to dressing. Ideas came from everywhere. One night while he was out at a nightclub, he saw his friend Paul Frecker wearing a 1930s double-breasted evening jacket. Again, just picture this for a minute. A nightclub. Let's just go out. I think I'll wear my 1930s double-breasted evening jacket with a cool back that Frecker had reworked into a pleated 1880s style bustle. Galliano was so dazzled by it, he turned to Brune and his friend, another friend, and said, that's my new shape. He reinterpreted a theme that, he had, that had been reinduced by, or been introduced by Jean-Paul Gaultier in Paris a year before, skirts for men. But it wasn't simply any old skirt. Galliano saw his friend Paul Frecker, by then who was helping out in the studio, wearing a pair of Yoji Yamamoto pants that were sort of skirt pants, like a hybrid. John was really inspired by this, Frecker recalls. And he got me to put it on, but put my legs through the middle instead of the trouser part, and then he had me walk back and forth. And from that, from that the, came the trousers for the Ludic game. Frecker, Frecker explained, quote, they were black they were green and black stripes, dark and tight. And over the top, there were big window pane checks in white that were, that were slightly fleecy. The green and black stripes were supposed to evoke plowed fields, as seen from above. And the window pane check was white, with white fluff was meant to be sheep's wool on barbed wire. <laughs> the pajama fabric clothes that they did, too, they did some out of pajama fabric, were inspired by the country women in England who throw a coat on over their pajamas to drive their kids to school. <laughs> it was all crazy creative, Frecker told me, and just fabulous. McQueen was just as creative and hands-on. He started his business in 1994 with virtually no money, really no money, in the basement of a condemned house owned by his friend Isabella Blow's mother-in-law, and later in a ground floor studio in the then squalid east end of London, Hoxton Square, now very trendy, hipsterish, then Needle Park. He cut and sewed the outfits himself, often from fabric he bought for super, super cheap, from a guy with a cart on Barrack Street in Soho. He'd pay maybe three bucks a yard, like super cheap. He couldn't even afford to buy fabric at a store. He bought it from a guy with a cart. Most of the clothes were never produced or sold. He made his money by doing special orders for friends. His first collection wasn't even conceived as one. He was simply making things with his friend and roommate Simon Unglis, a fellow St. Martin student who specialized in textiles. For a, couple, for a collection a, a season or two later to show his, his creativity, he found inspiration. I think this was actually the one that was his first show. So it was his second collection. National Geographic. I think the show was called Nihilism. Yeah, this was for Nihilism. And he saw this story in National Geographic about locusts wiping out thousands of acres of crops in Africa, leading to widespread famine. This he wanted to use as an inspiration for his collection. Somehow he was going to evoke this destruction of society and mankind through clothes. At the time, he'd been experimenting with plastic wrap, you know, saran wrap, like, but big, wide, like you get industrial in a restaurant. He'd use it to prote protect his dress forms. You know, he'd wrap them because he'd be flinging mud and latex and, you know, what drip paint on them clothes and so he wanted to protect the dress on me so he, he'd wrap them with this plastic but then he realized that the plastic itself created a perfect dress all he had to do was slice it up the back and put a zipper in it and he was done as his friend Simon Unglis recalled it was a happy mistake 
McQueen realized that this is how he could evoke the mass destruction by nature. He would cover the plastic wrap entirely with locusts. As if the locusts were actually devouring the person wearing them. The ultimate fashion victim. <laughs> Unglis found a local company that supplied formaldehyde treated locusts to schools for science projects. McQueen went to pick up the jar from them at the store, and Unglis started sewing them onto the plastic film shift, one by one. They were very squishy, and each time Unglis stuck with one with a needle, a bit of putrid liquid would ooze out. Look, looking back, Unglis told me, it was pretty gross. <laughs> McQueen and Unglis also started experimenting with latex in the backyard of their little council house in South London. Super cheap place, totally poor existence. They always describe these years, both McQueen and Galliano, as Dickensian. And I can tell you, having gone to these places and visited them, even now that they've been buffed up, Dickensian. One afternoon, Unglis was in the backyard making things, and he accidentally kicked over the can of latex, knocked it over, and spilled on a drain cover that was in the, in the yard on the terrace or in the yard on their yeah on their concrete patio they had a little drain thing instead of having like a heart attack over this McQueen was totally jazzed he's like this is great and he ran over and grabbed a handful of glitter and threw it in the latex once the sparkly latex dried they peeled it back and had this cool grid light imprint of the drain cover on it they decided to use it for the front of a dress of course True collaboration, Unglis said. That's how Galliano and McQueen worked back then. And for the first years of their career, Galliano for probably 10 years, McQueen for three or four. Hands on, twice, two collections a year, filled with true collaboration and happy mistakes. Selling a little bit, barely scraping by, and having a lot of fun. But at the same time that they were doing that, there were some businessmen who previously had little or no involvement or knowledge of fashion. They were taking over grand old brands like Dior, Givenchy, and Louis Vuitton and renovating them with the idea of peddling them, the products to the middle market, a burgeoning consumer class with disposable income from the internet dot-com boom. Remember back in the 90s when we all had a lot of money to spend? Right? It was kind of great, right? Well, there were some businessmen who said, we will find things for you to spend it on. The leader of these tycoons was and is a Frenchman named Bernard Arnault. Today, one of the top, one of the richest men in the world. Back then, only the head of, and still he is, the head of LVMH, LVMH, Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, a luxury group of more than 50 brands that you know and you heard of, like Louis Vuitton, Moet and Chandon Champagne, Hennessy Cognac, Guerlain Perfume, Givenchy. Arnaud needed, a bunch of watch brands do, but I don't, too, but I don't remember them all. Arnaud needed a new designer for one of the brands, Givenchy, because its founder, Hubert Givenchy, a distinguished count, who is the favorite couturier of the actress Audrey Hepburn, was retiring. Arnaud hired Galliano, and after two years of great success there, Arnaud moved Galliano over to another one of his houses, Christian Dior, and brought in McQueen. So they worked successively at Givenchy. Galliano, in turn, sold his namesake brand to Arnaud, believing that the cash infusion would help it grow. That would, you know, it was a trade-off. He would go work at Dior and get a nice paycheck and do these great things for Dior. And Mr. Arnaud would help him shape and turn his little company into something great. In theory, it sounded right. A good deal. Both designers were suddenly thrust into the spotlight as well as the corporate world of fashion, where marketing executives told them how much money they could spend what colors they needed to use because that's what sold in certain countries according to focus groups. Which photos would be used for the ads, what the perfume bottle would look like, what kind of sweet 
notes the perfume should have in them. Suddenly, these two were forced to make soul-crushing compromises, giving up their control, and keep producing more and more and more. There was kids' wear. There were shoes. There was handbags lines, lingerie lines, perfumes, more perfumes, more perfumes, fur lines, ready, secondary ready-to-wear, teen wear, jean lines. It just never stopped. The constant pressure, and, and it grew sort of little by little. It wasn't like it was all thrust on them, but they went from 2 to 6 to 8 to 12 to 14 to 16 to 20. You know, it's, oh, if you can do that much, let's add another one. That saying, if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person, that's what was going on here. The constant pressure to produce new was not new in fashion. Back in the 1970s, Yves Saint Laurent lamented, I've made a rope to hang myself with. I'd love to be able to do fashion when I want, but I'm a prisoner of my own commercial empire. What was new was that back then, when Yves Saint Laurent said that, the key words were, of my own commercial empire. He owned that company. It was his. Now, these companies were owned by somebody else, and the designers were simply employees, guns for hire. What was new was the corporatization and the democratization of the, luck, of the industry, and this phenomenal expansion on every front, which I talk about a lot in Deluxe. The designers could barely keep up, and they started self-medicating. They, they couldn't sleep at night because they were fretting about everything that needed to be done, so they took their Ambien. And then they couldn't get up in the morning, so they had to take something to pop them up. And then they were having anxiety attacks. They were on Xanax. And then they were having... It just went on and on and on and on. <clears throat> at Givenchy, this is at, when at Givenchy, McQueen started using cocaine. This guy became a massive drug addict. By the time he was 30, he didn't even touch it until he was 25. And by the time he was 30, he had a thousand dollar day habit because he just needed to get through the days and get through the work. And he was using cocaine like a college speed freak used speed. And they kept up on this hamster wheel for 10 years, running faster and faster and faster. Their anxiety and stress and responsibilities increasing with each season. They were no longer creators. They weren't thinking about famine and locusts. They weren't dying clothes in the, in the bathtub of the studio. They were managers, a job for which they were never trained and a job they actually never really wanted. They spent their days making decisions and telling other people what to do and what to make without any time to process the information. They weren't the only ones feeling that way. Last fall, Jean-Paul Gaultier, the guy who came up with that Skirts for Men thing 20 years ago, and who was best known for that cool corset that Madonna wore with the cone breasts when she was on tour 20 years ago or so, he shut down a major portion of his company last fall, only keeping open the twice a year made to order couture line and the perfumes business. Because he said, quote, commercial constraints, as well as the frenetic pace of collections, don't leave any freedom nor the necessary time to find fresh ideas or to innovate. It comes to a point where you don't even have time to think. Galliano and McQueen didn't have the luxury of time to make such a decision like Gautier made this last year. Instead, they kept running on that hamster wheel until as one designer who did opt out told me they were flung off into a heap of dung. McQueen descended into a profound depression with acute anxiety that drove him to suicide. Galliano mixed pills with drink and eventually imploded. He says now that had he not been fired and forced into rehab, he believes, too, that he would have died within six months. At the time he was fired, he was overseeing 32 collections a year between Dior and his own brand. Yes, he had the help of 
loads of assistance to help to execute those ideas. Dior gave him as much, you know, staff support as he needed. But it, he still had to generate an enormous number of ideas all the time, like just poof, 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 poof. And for someone who loved to control creation, who had to find that perfect hue of that fabric by dyeing it himself, and who was running on uppers, downers, and booze, this was just too much to process. He just was, his brain was exploding and melting. And it was a long way from those two collections a year. A long, long way. Now, I do not believe it's a coincidence that Galliano McQueen's careers came to a close as they were at those times, so close together. What became apparent as the globalization of fashion, as with cinema, as with art, as with music, as with literature, as with everything that is a creative business in the last 20 years, They've gotten so big and they've, they're, they've ramped up so fast to keep changing product, to get people to keep spending money, to keep going into stores, to keep buying more and more and more about growth, about shares for pro, uh, profits for shareholders, about quarterly projections, that they have lost track of the whole idea of creation. Instead, it's become this gigantic machine just churning out commercial product to sell to the masses all the time. There is no such thing as reaching a certain level in your business and being happy with it and evolving creatively within that, in that size of the company or growing slowly. You must always grow a lot all, constantly in sales, not just in creation. Today, the average fashion show lasts 12 minutes. In the days of Christian Dior and Yves Saint Laurent, they lasted two hours. When I first started covering them in the, in the 90s, they lasted about 30 to 40. Now they're down to 12 minutes. People time them. And they, everybody in the front row gets up and they run out to their car, waiting cars to take them to the next one, even before the designers come out to take his bow. Nobody even writes, takes notes anymore. They just Instagram it, hashtag it, and move on. And this is the press corps. Nothing even sinks in. You, you snap it, you leap. They don't even look at the clothes anymore. They look at their telephone screens. It's incredible. I take pictures now of the front row, and all you see are just telephone screens. Instagram stars dictate what, what's hip today. I mean, if it weren't for Robin Gavon at the Washington Post and Vanessa Friedman at the New York Times and Booth Moore at the LA Times, there would be no fashion writing. I mean, I'm writing a book about it, which is kind of crazy, the antithesis of Instagram. But there is no fashion writing anymore. It's just barrage of, of, of images and, and clips of you to just say, hey, that's great. I need it now. Fast food, everything is fast is at the pace of fast food to be consumed like fast food. Designers are mostly rank and file employees now who have studied to be managers. They don't just go to art schools and take art classes. They actually have to take some business classes now. And they're kind of good at it. They go to work. They spend their days reinterpreting somebody else's ideas, usually out of the archives. They don't have to dream up new things. They just take out old things, look at them, and say, how can we redo them? They cash their checks. They have benefits. They do not lie awake at night fretting over a seam or leap out of bed, run to the studio, and fix that seam like Galliano McQueen used to do. For them, it's a job. The day of star designers is over brand names reign. It's just business. Thank you. So we do have some time for questions. If you have one, please come to one of our microphones up here. Where am I? Oh, there. Questions, questions. No questions. 
Well, that means I did a good job. <laughs> yes, Mary Jordan has a question. Ah, see, this is a really great, I'm glad you said that. We'll read it straight out of the book because it's, it's so great. Um, Ray Dong Chong, remember her? It's about Ray Dong Chong. See if she's listed. Like, the index is never, like whenever you look for something in the index, it's never in there, no matter what you do. Ray Dong She's not in there. I will find it. Give me one sec. Um, what was that movie called that she was in? You know. <laughs> Quest for Fire. Quest for Fire. Okay. I will find this because it's so great. Quest for Fire, there it is, 110. Back in Tooting Beck, where McQueen and his friend Simon Unglis were living in a little council house in the south, southern London, McQueen had become as what Unglis describes as a little too obsessed with recent St. Martin's graduate Hussein Shalayan's degree collection. The Tangent Flows, another one with a title. For it, Shalayan made several silk dresses, then buried them in his backyard for a few weeks to decay. The rotten dresses were the hit of the degree show. And with Galliano's, as with Galliano's Le, Les Incroyables collection a, year, er, a decade earlier, his graduation collection, Brown's, the local department store, bought the clothes and put them in their store windows. Thus, Hussein Shalayan was a star. McQueen decided to take Shalayan's backyard decay idea and do it better, because that's what he liked to do. He liked to do anything anyone else could do better. He draped and cut white chiffon on the stand, on top of the saran wrap, turning out pretty dresses that Unglis remembers were quite romantic, actually. They bought some red clay, watered it down, and dripped it all over the dresses and left them hanging there in the backyard for a few weeks. The clay stained the fabric, dried and cracked and peeled. The dresses turned out to be a sort of brick red with small chips of clay embedded in the fabric. The effect was, quote, very quest for fire, end quote. Unglis says, referring to the prehistoric fantasy movie. So that's what they did. They were flinging paint and dripping clay and latex at clothes. There was a collection he did, that same one, Nihilism, where he also like threw red paint on it so it looked like blood dripping. On, and he had handprints of blood on the dresses. And, um, and it would seep through the fabric. So he protected the dummies with plastic so it didn't stain the dummies too much. Because he could only afford one, which he probably stole from school. <laughs> he had a habit of doing that. Any other questions? Yes. Um, thank you. We saw the Metropolitan Museum of Art exhibit on McQueen. It was absolutely sensational. And you say it's going to London? It's going to London next month. Absolutely. And a deep culture as well. So um, he did seem to have a kind of world view that he wanted to express through fashion. Absolutely. It was not just uh, flinging paint to. No. To, uh, that was a technique. But he, uh, McQueen had a, a real philosophical point of view. He came from the East End. He came from true working class. I mean, rough working class. And he was a gay boy growing up in a neighborhood where you got beat up for gay, being gay. So he became a skinhead. He was part of one of those hooligan gangs that used to cause trouble at the soccer matches. Remember when people died? Well, yeah, he was one of those guys. 
He wasn't doing that, but he was one of those guys as part of his tough guy, guy persona. But he also really embraced his rough, poor roots. He didn't try to wash them, whitewash them away and, and better himself and posh himself up. And he really was democratic. But he had a very strong point of view. He was anti-monarchist. Like, oh, he just could not bear the Queen and the Windsor family. He just... And then he was he was made a, he was knighted, and um, well, he wasn't knighted. He was made an OBE, and and he didn't want to do it, and his mother made him do it. And um, and when he went to meet the Queen, and he locked eyes with her, he he said he fell in love with her. And he decided maybe she wasn't so bad after all. And then he actually did a, a, a collection much later in his career, one of the last ones, that was inspired by her, called The Girl in the Tree. And he laughed and said, who knows, maybe she'll hear this and she'll make me a knight. I wouldn't mind being Sir Alexander. But no, his, his collections, he used clothes like writers use words, like painters use paint, use paint like artists like he used it as a way to talk about a much bigger thing that was very profound very um argumentative very strong strong-minded very democratic um and he he clothes weren't just about being beautiful or being looking good john was mcqueen said uh, he he said, John is the romantic and I am the realist. And um, John liked to put women up on a pedestal like goddesses, drape them in soft fabrics, chiffony fabrics and silk fabrics and rich and jewels and, you know, beautiful colors, magenta and gold and turquoise and, and make them just look like, you know, these goddesses that are untouchable and what we worship. McQueen used clothes to empower women, like Saint Laurent. And, to, and that's why he had so many comparisons to Saint Laurent very early on, as an armor, because his, his sisters had a tough life, and one of, one of them, at least, was in a very abusive relationship. So he wanted to give women strength through clothes. And I actually know somebody who worked with him and had to wear them for a living. And she'd say, you know, by the end of the those those clothes took a lot to wear. They took a lot of energy to wear. And by the end of the day, you got home, you were really tired. <laughs> and you just had to take off that, that suit because it was exhausting. And it wasn't exhausting because it was heavy, but it's just because it demanded you to be strong. But he also would make crazy commentaries through his shows not crazy comedy but crazy complicated and thoughtful and thought out commentaries through his shows he one of my favorites is one called it's a merry-go-round and it was just after he was he quit Givenchy and sold his company to Gucci group and he was just getting treated so badly by Givenchy they they canceled his show they they were they were bad mouthing him. They were saying, "Well, we were going to fire him anyway because he was no good." It was just like nasty political warfare. And he still had his own collection in London, so he did this show called "It's a." And meanwhile, he he had no respect for John at that point. He was like, "John, you know, we both made this Faustian pact, but John is completely like fine with it." And I realized it's awful, and I got to get out of here. So he decided to use that show to mock John's complacency in working for Arno and John just totally going for the money, 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 and having sold out his soul, his creative soul. He did this show where they had them riding around on a merry-go-round, like a real merry-go-round. And the women were all, all the models were wearing clothes that were riffs on what John does. I mean, if you look at the picture that's in the book, they're wearing Galliano like little goddess gowns, but they're kind of cartoony, like a little exaggerated or a little torn. They're like uh, off. They're off. And then their hair's all done up like in a goofy way 
that John had for an early show that was very distinctive, where they were like tricorns, except they were in hair, gray hair. And then he had them all, all the makeup done like clowns. He was just skewering, and then he called it, it's a merry-go-round. He was just going around on a merry-go-round, dude. He had another show where it was just a chessboard, and the models moved around controlled by somebody moving the pieces as if this were a commentary on how they were they were seen as designers in the business he um he had um i've been trying to figure out voss voss was i think his most stupendous show and i thought i understood it and then something clicked recently it's about he he loved birds and so it was supposed to be about this town in Norway that is the center for bird watching in Europe. But then I started wondering if it wasn't that he was just, as the Brits say, taking the piss out of us for drinking that Voss mineral water. I looked at that at a restaurant recently. I was like, that's what that's about. Like, nobody got it. And, and then he would often say, like, his first show for Givenchy, the soundtrack was this great disco tune, Take That to the Bank. And he said nobody got that either. And, um, and, he, um, and he invoked Maria Callas. And he said nobody got that. And I'm still working out the Maria Callas reference, but I think it had to do with being the mistress of Aristotle, but not ever getting to marry, him. and basically selling out, and then and that maybe John was Jackie O, which I could totally imagine. <laughs> but he was always working in all these complicated things. Yes, there was like feasts, there was famines in Africa in his clothes, and there was, and there was total destruction of Guatemala in his clothes, and from hurricanes, and there was, there was, you know, anti-monarchist movements in his clothes and then there was the love of the monarchy in his clothes he was working all these different things out all the time plus his own personal story and i realized that that was the most important one when um two years into reporting on the book someone said to me almost offhandedly well you know he was hiv positive positive." and i said no i did not know this and i've been working on this for two years and nobody has said a peep about this and nobody's ever written this. And it's never been even a slight buzz in the fashion community. There's, you know, several designers we've been talking about for years. You know, he's HIV positive, but he's on the meds and he's fine. You know, there's sort of a short list that we all know. McQueen was never on that list. Nobody knew this. Nobody talked about it. So I called back my sources and I said, uh, he was HIV positive? And they said, yes. But we didn't want to be the ones to tell you. If you'd asked us, we, as you are now, now I'll tell you the whole story. But I didn't want to be the one to bring it up. So I got the whole story in two hours, after two years of not knowing it. But what I found really interesting was my favorite McQueen show ever was every, actually my favorite fashion show ever, which is saying something because I've been to a lot of fashion shows, was this one based on Sidney Lumet's movie, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? about the dance marathon and I always thought it was about how the industry was running him into the ground and he was so exhausted from his work and the like the girls at the end and it was really moving where at the end the dancers are just collapsing from exhaustion and flailing about in these beautiful McQueen gowns silver lame in 1930s and just I can't even begin to think how to describe them, but they were just ethereal, beautiful clothes, shimmering in the spotlight of this dance hall in this 1880s dance hall in Paris on an old wooden floor, flailing about. And the last dancer, they had dancers from the Michael Clark Dance Company and the models together working. The dancer just collapses in a heap on the floor utterly exhausted. And I always thought that this was about the business. 
But then I realized this was when he found out he'd been diagnosed with HIV. And it suddenly became clear that this was his life and that he was running and that he was going to collapse on the floor completely expended. And after that, all of his shows seemed to be more profound, have a, a slight wistfulness about death in them. And, um, and had a poetic beauty to them, as if he was really trying to say that life is so special, we need to appreciate it, and mine will be shorter. And I also understood more his suicide. I didn't buy that thing about his mother being sick. A friend of his told me that he thought that McQueen killed himself because his mother had died, therefore giving him permission. He could never do it before. He'd been talking about it since 1995, I've discovered. And he'd had a couple overdoses, and he'd even made a plan to shoot himself in the head in front of the entire fashion corps at the end of a fashion show in a glass box just to make sure the effect was completely there, as if to say, look what you people have driven me to do. And he didn't do it because it would have too upset his mother. She would have been devastated by this. He was her baby. But he knew she had terminal cancer. She knew he was he knew she was dying. He went and checked with the CEO of his company to see if his company was set up to go on without him. He groomed his number two to take over. And days after his mother was gone, he finally went through with it because she wouldn't be upset anymore. And I think, in part, he did this because for him, HIV was a terminal illness. He was never going to get old. Yes, it's incredibly manageable today, but you have to manage it. And he was so busy managing everything else, he couldn't manage that too. He was trying to go to a shrink to get help and get off meds and go to rehab. And he kept having to cut, cancel his appointments because he had too much work to do. There was nobody at the office saying, your schedule is clear, the car is waiting, you got to go. Instead, they say, we have a meeting. He couldn't get off the hamster wheel. And this was the only way off. And that for him, HIV was this, it was the end of the chapter for him anyway. He was going to die anyway. I, for me, it was like, okay, it was a, he just realized that life is short, so I'm going to make the most of it in this sprint. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of it before the disease takes me. And so he did. And from that point onward, the shows made sense to me. And I completely understood what was happening in a way that none of us did when we were sitting in the room watching it. I think that's good, don't you? Should we sign some books? All right. Oh, wait, well, one more little question. Not for the moment, but they come. You know, we had Coco in the 20s. We had Balenciaga in the 50s. We had Saint Laurent in the 60s and early 70s. What about Um, oh, but he comes from money. He's he's like Mr. Corporate already. He, he's, he's fine. That guy's never going to suffer, and he does not lay away in bed worrying about... I mean, he's an old club kid. He doesn't worry about seams. Um... I like his work, but it doesn't, it isn't poetic, it isn't full of angst, and it's certainly not making a political statement. Um, no, I think right now we're in a period of pure commerciality and just about making money and having a good life, and you know, it's just become this machine. But this happens, and then somebody will be completely disenchanted by this and will rise up very small, broke, with no money and start shaking, shaking things. I'm hoping it'll happen again before I retire from this beat because I would like to see another one do that. But I'm really lucky that I got to watch these two do it from the beginning to the end. And John's doing his thing now, but it'll never be like 
the mid '90s when he was just making things out of nothing with no money and a lot of heart and a lot of imagination. Those days are gone for him, and uh, and maybe someone will come along again. We'll see. I hope so. That's the beauty of creativity. Thanks. Thank you.